हमी अब प्रोग्राम को सेकेंड सेशन में लाइक वी इंटरिंग टू द कोर टॉपिक टॉपिक फर डिलिब्रेशन्स सो तो टपिक में हम स्पीकर फर्स्ट स्पीकर हो मिस्टर चौधरी एमएक्यू सरावर सो एक्चुअली इट्स ग्रेट टू बी कनेक्टेड विथ सरावर भाई वंस अगेन बैक इन टू थाउजेंड इलेवेन वर्ल्ड बैंक आई एफ सी इन्वाइटेड मी टू अंडर गो मस्टर ट्रेनर इन कर्पोरेट गवर्नेंस इन ढाका सो इट दैट प्रोग्राम एक्चुअली हेड अ टू लेवल लेवल वन एंड लेवल टू सो ही वॉज माई कुलिग क्लासमेट और बैसमेट और वॉट एवर वी कॉल इट सो वी हेड लट अफ फन अबाउट फोर फाइव डेज देन दैट वॉज फलोड फलोड अप बाई एडवांस प्रोग्राम इन टू थाउजेंड एंड थर्टीन इन ढाका अगेन अंटिल लास्ट इयर आई वॉज दी ओनली ट्रेनर सर्टिफाइड बाई वर्ल्ड बैंक इन नेपाल फॉर दी टू ट्रेन योर डायरेक्टर्स एंड चेयरमैन बट देन आई रिक्वेस्टेड आई एफ सी दैट आई कैन नट डू इट अलोन सो आई एफ सी केम एंड द टीम केम टू नेपाल एंड अगेन वी डी दी ट्रेन अबाउट आई थिंक फिफ्टीन और ट्वेंटी सो चेयरमैन अफ नेपाल बैंक लिमिटेड हुज सिटिंग विथ हस वासुदेव अधिकारी सर इज अल्सो नाउ दी आई एफ सी सर्टिफाइड ट्रेनर एंड सचिन जोशी आई कैन रिकॉल हु एल्स देर इज अ कपल अफ पीपल कपल अफ पीपल सर्टिफाइड नाउ सर्टिफाइड आफ्टर मी सो दैट गिव्स अ लट अफ गुड पोजिशनिंग अल्सो ग्लोबल पोजिशनिंग अल्सो नेपाल एज अ नेपाल पर्टिकुलरली इन द कर्पोरेट गवर्नेंस ट्रेनिंग एरिया सरावर जी लाइक ही कम्स फ्रॉम द लाइक वेरी सीजन बैकग्राउंड वेल रेस्पेक्टेड नेम इन दी कंट्री इन ढाका इन बांग्लादेश आई नो द कंट्री एटलिस्ट प्रिटी वेल इन माइ सेंस ऑफ विजिटिंग देम एंड इंटरैक्टिंग विद द कंट्री फॉर लास्ट टेन इयर्स पर्टिकुलरली इन द बैंकिंग एरिया इन टर्म्स ऑफ दी द काइंड ऑफ दी मोर और लेस वी आर इन टू द सेम फूटिंग आई वुड कॉल इट Uh, except for the Bangladeshi economy is growing really, really very good, very rapid, rapid growth, uh, very impressive growth actually, 8% uh, on an average, 8% growth uh, for the size of the GDP they have, particularly led by what they call is popularly RMG, so ready-made garments, uh, uh, it's a global hub actually for the contract manufacturing and the RMG aspect. and uh, because of the high export as well as the import uh, kind of uh, based economy and the remittances uh, migrant labors and the internal production i think the lot of issues revolves of course around the uh, cross border payments when the cross border payment and the internal uh, uh, anti money laundering sampatti suddhikaran ka kura haru dekhi lera counterfeit uh, yo terrorism ko kura haru dekhi lera lot of issues i think he would be able to present So, with that note, uh, I'd like to uh, request Sir Arvai to come and share his thought and uh, presentation. Kindly profit from his expertise and experience. Engage him again. Just a gentle reminder: questions should not go laggy. You can go to slido.com in your mobile phone. Slido.com, S-L-I-D-O. Theo, that I have written in my mind. Write sir. Slido.com. Magar, your number four A-M-L. If you type it, then Hamro page ma also. Then you can. post question any question you want we appreciate if you write your name because anonymous bhanne auncha naam lekh dinu bhayo bhane chai gift paunu huncha so tyo hisab ma if you want to be active in social media twitter uh, facebook hashtag is again uh, nbi aml summit 2019 uh, slido.com has for aml for any questions if you don't prefer using going uh, digital you could always you know raise your hand and ask a question but then the tone uh, i think the sarawar bhai would be setting the tone uh, how the protocol for uh, for the q and a so with that note welcome sarawar bhai thank you thank you very much stick this here and let it stay here a very good morning and namaste to all of you here It's really a privilege and honor for me uh, to be invited here to speak before the banking community of Nepal. I would like to thank Sanjeev ji and, of course, Shirish for inviting me here today. Uh, since there's a paucity of time, uh, I think I should uh, dive into the presentation. So, I mean. i would like this to be interactive and uh, if you have any questions please raise your hands 
And of course, we can have a question and answer session at the end, if time permits. So what I'll try to do is, uh, I think everybody knows what is correspondent banking. But to set the perspective, uh, I, I'll put some definitions here from the global bank's perspectives and the different risks posed by various counterparties. The global regulatory regime. Of course, as you all know, AML started with the US, in the US. And now it's a global, globally accepted, you know, FATF standards everywhere. So there was the Patriot Act, the OFAC, the sanctions compliance, and FATF imposing various requirements. Now, you all must be having, I mean, Nepali banks definitely have correspondent banking relationships. Without that, you cannot do foreign exchange transactions, I mean. So, you may have heard about Wolfsburg correspondent banking questionnaire. It's a due diligence questionnaire. The global banks, not only global banks, most banks are adapting that and using it to do, you know, due diligence on their respondent banks. So we'll talk about that a little bit because this is actually uh, posing a serious challenge, at least in our country. And I'm sure it may be similar for Nepal. Uh, we'll talk about corresponding banking products and their inherent risks. So correspondent banking relationship involves the provision of banking services by one financial institution to another financial institution, which is located in a different jurisdiction. Actually, even locally and domestically, one bank may have a relationship with another local bank where they don't have a branch, you know, to, but what we are talking about is mostly your relationship with foreign banks. But for them, for global banks, banks in Nepal or even in our country, we are called foreign financial institutions. So without a correspondent banking relationship, you cannot handle US dollar transactions or even EU or any foreign currency transactions, you need to have a Nostro account. So when you have a Nostro account with another bank in another jurisdiction, that's a correspondent banking relationship. And this is used for various purposes, for payments, for clearing checks, uh, for LC reimbursements, then payable through accounts. I don't think we use that a lot, loans and trade finance. Uh, corresponding banking relationships are vulnerable to money laundering and terrorist financing because they involve a bank carrying out transactions on behalf of another bank's customers, where information on those customers is very limited. For instance, you have a correspondent banking relationship with some bank in Bangladesh. Now, that you, it's impossible for you to be aware of the risk profile of the bank in Bangladesh or the kind of customers they have for whom you are handling transactions. Now, <clears throat> this correspondent banking, that it is posing a serious risk, this was first identified in the US again. If you remember, the AML CFT regime was intensified globally following 9-11. So 9-11 happened on September, uh, November 9th, 2011. Whereas in February, in fact, 5th February, 2001, in the US, uh, there is this, uh, they have Senate subcommittees. Now, this subcommittee is called Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the Committee of Governmental Affairs of the U.S. Senate. A report was prepared for that committee, was titled, A Gateway for a 
correspondent banking, a gateway for money laundering reports. Now, it, I'm just quoting from that here. U.S. banks through correspondent bank, correspondent accounts they provide to foreign banks have become conduits for dirty money flowing into the American financial system and have, as a result, facilitated illicit enterprises, including drug trafficking and financial fraud. That was a huge report, and some actions were already being taken to address those risks, but after 9-11, that was intensified. And gradually, the American standards were adapt adapted or adopted by other non-US global commercial banks, as well as later by the FATF itself. In the US, there is this Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council. Now, I'm again quoting from that the manual of FFIEC, it says some foreign financial institutions are not subject to the same or similar regulatory guidelines as U.S. banks. Therefore, these foreign institutions may pose a higher money laundering risk to their respective U.S. bank correspondents. That was the challenge. That the standards in Bangladesh or even in Nepal, the AML standards are not similar to US or other global standards. So that posed a problem. And that poses a problem for them. And in that same manual it says, investigations have disclosed that in the past, foreign correspondent accounts have been used by drug traffickers and other criminal elements to launder money, funds. Shell companies are sometimes used in the layering process to hide the true ownership of accounts at foreign correspondent financial institutions. Now, because of US banks' potential lack of familiarity with foreign correspondent financial institutions' customers, for, for them, we are foreign. So they are not familiar with, say, Nepal's, you know, they are not familiar with your AML regulations. So. Criminals and terrorists can more easily conceal the source and use of illicit funds. Consequently, each U.S. bank, including all overseas branches, offices, and subsidiaries, should closely monitor transactions related to foreign correspondence. So that, because of these stringent regulations being imposed, therefore, the f there, there was this focus on managing correspondent banking risk for them. And again, these were intensified in the U.S. Patriot Act. I'll not go through this, but here they have powers in that act to impose special measures on countries like us or banks like us if they feel that our standards are not up to par. And of course, shell bank transaction is prohibited. Uh, and from then on, if you remember, they, U.S. banks require a correspondent bank certification or certificate from you, where also you agree to several things. You, 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 you tell them about your ownership, you know, and the beneficial ownership, and then, of course, there is this 120-hour uh, rule, which is, works out at five days. So if a foreign regulator is asking for any information from a Nepali bank, they are supposed to pr produce that within five days. And of course, the requirement of appointing a process server in the US to whom they will serve notice to provide information which you have to comply. And then they have a very stringent customer identification program, blah, blah. So it all actually emerge from, as I, as I mentioned before, that report in the Senate subcommittee, and then 9-11 happening, uh, and Patriot Act, and of course, if it, if it, if standards were revised, and FATF mutually evaluations in, intensified, and then there's another group, uh, which uh, is known as Wolfsburg Group. There are 
It was started by 11 foreign banks, global banks. Of course, now there are 11, uh, 13 members. And uh, they set up standards. It started initially with uh, AML, AML regulations or standards for uh, private banking. And now they have uh, a full blown, as I said, uh, call this questionnaire, correspondent banking questionnaire for d due diligence. Uh, it, it was started uh, long ago, but recently, last year, they revamped it. Now there are more than 200 questions there. So we'll cover that later. Now, <clears throat> the bank's AML compliance pro program, what are the risk considerations for them? I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from their perspective because we are supposed to comply with that if you want to have a correspondent relationship with a global bank. So the AML compliance program has to be tailored to the specific risks of your particular bank. Every bank in Nepal doesn't have the same risk profile because you don't deal with the same kind of customers. You don't have similar products probably. Even if you have your, your customers, the, even if you have similar kind of customers, maybe a particular bank has more high risk customers than another bank. Or maybe the, the risk assessment is not as robust. So that maybe, you know, at least I've seen this in, in, in our country, that uh, this issue is coming up again and again. There's some branches don't know, or they don't have a list of high risk customers. That means that an assessment was not done. And uh, so they are talking about entity risks, meaning if you have a subsidiary, that includes in that entity. If you have branches anywhere, even within or outside the country. So entity risks related to products, services, customers, and geographic locations are not properly identified, updated, and incorporated into the AML compliance program. So monitoring objective is to assess the adequacy of the entity risk profile, that means your bank's risk profile, development and updating process. Development meaning risk, you know, AML risk, new typologies may emerge, which you need to again do a self-assessment on a periodic basis, preferably uh, annually, or if some trigger events happen. A and then you should revise your policies accordingly. Now these, the risk factors, are, the, for example, clients. Among clients, you may have high net worth individuals, even other financial institutions as clients, which, which the correspondent relationship means that. Non-traditional banking businesses, money service businesses, charitable organizations, not for profits, any type of business identified by government authorities as high risk for money laundering. And what are you doing about those risks? What enhanced due diligence you are performing? Products and services, correspondent banking is itself a risky business. Of course, there are other risks in correspondent banking, which uh, your, any correspondent bank, like business risks are there, you, whether this is a remunerative for you. Uh, those, we are not talking about those kinds of risks here. We are only concentrating on the AML CFT risk. Uh, then, then they may be payable through accounts. And can anyone tell me what's payable through account? which I think currently most global banks don't allow it, but previously it was a practice that say you have a correspondent relationship with XYZ bank in the US or UK, and, and that bank, that correspondent bank, allowed your clients to also write checks on them. So these checks were issued to your selected clients and, and they could draw on that account, or even uh, transfer funds from that account. So that's payable through account. And then the opposite is nested account. Nested account is like you, you are allowing another financial institutions to use your account. With, I mean, the global bank is not so much aware of that. Uh, then wire transfers, there are now even in the SWIFT transactions, there are fields which are now compulsory. And so these all happened 
because of the risk these were posed. Then there were geographic risks. Geographic risks, there are various, I think, uh, high-risk high lists. One is the FATF. These are like previously they used to call it NCCT, which is non-cooperative countries and jurisdiction. Currently, what they do after mutual evaluation, if they find a country is not uh, up to mark, so if they are non-compliant with, so depending on the, you know, in the 40 recommendations, depending on the number, and there are also some key recommendations, which is compulsory. So if you are lacking in that, then you are put in a gray list, and it's called ICRG process, and through which you are given time and, and even guidance to uh, reform, to bring reforms. So it's not only on banks, it, it's also, there may be that your, what should I say, the, your uh, laws. So there, there has to be some legislative changes to make it aligned with the FATF 40, which, is hap which happens everywhere in Bangladesh. The law was amended several times, and now it's aligned with the 2012 version of the uh, 40 recommendations. Now, internal controls. The level of sophistication of internal controls should be commensurate with size, structure, risk, and complexity of financial. It means that the internal control regime is not a one-size-fits-all thing. You know, again, this will be based on risk assessment and the controls that you put as mitigants. If internal controls are inadequate, the financial system may not be able to detect, report, and monitor suspicious activity. So the monitoring objective is to determine whether internal controls ensure compliance with uh, and provide sufficient risk management, especially for high-risk operations, products, services, customers, geographies. Governance, this is very important. For instance, board and senior management accountability for effectiveness of AML CFT sanctions compliance program. I, I, I remember, it, it, you know, you were having this summit in Bangladesh. Uh, the, there's an annual conference of, they call it Camel Co's and Deputy Camel Co's. Camel Co is, con, is Chief Anti-Money Laundering Compliance Officer. So this is an annual thing happening. So in 2015, so our bank secretary, uh, Mr. Aslam Alam, was there. And he happened to be the secretary for banking affairs under Ministry of Finance. And he inaugurated that session. And he was mentioning that earlier he was not, I mean, he did not give, think that this was so important that, you know, this AML, that uh, this knowledge or awareness at senior levels, at least board level and all. So there's this bank, uh, Sonali UK. So Sonali Bank is our largest uh, state-owned bank. They have a uh, subsidiary in the UK. Subsidiary means they own 49%. The government itself owns 51%. So, so the Sonali UK, he happened to be the chairman. So the FSA, FSA is the, used to be the Financial Services Authority, the regulator in the UK. They had summoned him because of money laundering lapses there. And they asked him that, it, uh, have you undergone any AML training? He said, no. Has your board undergone any AML training? He said, no. I mean, he, well, this is, for only this reason we can find you. So that is when he realized that, because, which is true, whatever, I mean, risk management, compliance, whatever we say, this has to be top down. If there is no senior management commitment, this will not happen. If the right tone is not set at the board level and then the senior management level, whatever policies you may have, I mean, policy, if you look at any bank's policy, these are mostly cut and paste. So this will be like international standard, but it's not followed. It's not followed, 
because either your senior management, by their body language or whatever, they tell you, you get the message that it's not so important. So unless the right tone is set, that means the right behavior at the senior level and commitment, then actually all this will not happen, frankly speaking. Because, because if you're only given targets, huh, you're only interested in business and your performance or your bonus or your increment, your promotion, all depends on that and not on you know, regulatory compliance or any compliance or risk management, then you cannot expect that this happens. So there should be business accountability for compliance including bearing responsibility for AML, CFT, and sanction lapses. Now, in a country like Nepal or even Bangladesh, still I think the understanding, misunderstanding, I should say, is that the AML department is responsible for compliance. But actually, it's the other way around. KYC, AML department is responsible for KYC. But that's not true. It is the business who needs that? KYC, customer due diligence, this has to be done by the business. That awareness has to happen. If you don't mind, I think I'm feeling hot. If this temperature is high. I'll take this off. Oh, I have to take this out. This will also come out. Sorry for the interruption, anyway. So, independence of the compliance function. It cannot report to a business function. They have to be independent. Just like internal audit. Identification of high-risk areas. Providing appropriate internal policies, procedures, and controls for screening and reporting. Establish independent testing for compliance with AML safety, as well as UN San Security Council sanctions, OFAC, and other sanctions. Designation of AML and sanction compliance officers, ongoing training program for appropriate personnel in all relevant areas of the bank. This, this is the governor's role. And this, your top management is responsible for this. They have to ensure this is happening. Now, for governance oversight, the board acting through senior management is ultimately responsible for assuring that the financial system maintain an effective AML safety internal control structure including suspicious activity monitoring reporting. Their oversight is a crucial element of a sound risk management and control environment. Now, how this is achieved? Recently, following the FATF uh, 2012 revision, as I said, laws were changed in Bangladesh. And in 2015, they have rolled out a master circular where they have brought in a concept called CCC. Uh, we call it triple C in our bank. This is Central Compliance Committee. And the regulation says that at least it has to be a eight member committee, including the Camel Corps, the Chief anti management Compliance Officer. And the rest seven should be drawn from the heads of businesses and op operations even finance, and this committee will actually drive and draw up the policies and then present it to the board through the CEO for approval. What, happened, what the intention was is really great, that then you get everybody on board, you see, engage them so that they participate and they know that when they tell their people to comply rather than the compliance department, then of course this thing gets embedded much quicker. But unfortunately, most banks uh, have not yet, you know, implemented that, or they are just starting to implement. So there are challenges. Training. So if you don't train your people properly on AML safety issues, then how do you expect them to prevent, detect, or monitor suspicious transactions? So the board must also receive training, as I said, and senior management. And in fact, everybody is required to be trained and on a periodic basis. 
it used to be previously every two years. For This is a general awareness, and also because the regulations change, the laws change, and the policies will change, and therefore uh, this uh, regular training should be there. And you should have targeted specific training for compliance personnel, for transaction the guys who will be doing the transaction monitoring. Then you, you, there is a concept called branch anti-money laundering compliance officers. Now the regulation says you should have somebody at a very senior level in the branch to do that role, but that should be the primary role. But for smaller branches, there could be double hatting, but this being the main role. Whereas in practice, it's exactly the opposite. So the branch operations head is also double hatting as Bamilko. He just doesn't have time to look into the Bamilko role. Then you are defeating the purpose. So training has to be targeted. For Bamilkos, we have, at least in, in, in our bank, I've started targeted training for different segments, for business people, for frontline guys, for Bamilkos. You should be doing the same. And so that they are equipped, so that they know, you know how to uh, implement the regulations. And even explain to their customers. Customer identification. So you cannot open an account without ensuring, that means verifying the account holder's identity. And identity documents sh should be safeguarded. It should be reliable. For instance, you need a government-issued photo identification document in your record. And recently, it's become easier in our country. Earlier, the verification was difficult. Today, you are required to give your national ID, and then the banks can you know, verify from the uh, National ID Authority database. So th that's a good process, which maybe in Nepal you can start. Then also beneficial ownership. In, in, you know, in, of, but beneficial ownership concept is misunderstood in our country, even by regulators. For instance, when in Bangladesh you go to any bank and ask any branch guy about beneficial ownership, who is the beneficial owner, likely beneficial owner, and the answer will be promptly housewives. <laughs> but housewives, they, they can, I mean, they can have their own income. And that account is hers. Beneficial owner is, that, that means the housewife has no control over that account. She cannot use it as she likes. If she can, but what FATF meant, FATF meant actually beneficial ownership of entities or arrangements like trusts. Entities meaning corporate. So, which is rare in Bangladesh. I don't know if it is so much in Nepal, like company A is owned by company B and company C. So you don't know who's behind. So that's what FATF is saying, that you have to identify the individual behind who, who has at least more than 20% ownership. Now you dig down, it's called unwrapping. In Hindi, parde ke piche kya hai? So you have to see who is behind the wheel. So you do an unwrapping. So when you unwrap B, you find that the B is owned by E and F, company E and F. You have to dig down until you get to the individuals. So th that is the concept of beneficial owners globally. But I think in the subcontinent, it has become something else. Because people open account in their driver's name in the servant's name, especially those who are corrupt, and also those who are in a way corrupt because uh, they're evading taxes. Uh, customer due diligence, yeah. So what is due diligence? Previously, we, we've used, everybody used to say KYC, 
So you're doing a KYC. But due diligence is more than that. KYC is you know your customer, but when you do a due diligence, you know his occupation, what he's doing, what is his business, how much he earns. And if you want to really do a proper due diligence, then you should know whether he has sugar in his tea, and if he has sugar, how many spoon? That level of knowledge you should have about your customer. And due diligence means identifying whether this guy is the risk he poses to the bank is really, you know, you are comfortable with that to onboard him as a client. And if you do, if you still want to do, what, I, what enhanced due diligence are you doing? So enhanced due diligence means, for instance, getting a, his will statement or getting additional information on him and also additional, I mean, enhanced due diligence also means that going forward you will be monitoring this account more intensively than other accounts. That's the risk-based approach. SARS. Now, filing of <laughs> SAR means suspicious activity reporting. But in our country, it is, it is, though it is called STR, but the regulation also requires you to file, other than suspicious transactions, even suspicious activities. Of course, transactions are also activities. That is why in the US or in the globally, they call it SAR. Because SAR includes both tran transactions as well as other suspicious. Suspicious activities means he comes to the branch, he's uh, reluctant to provide you with the required, why you need it, huh? or he, he's dilly-dallying. So that should give you a, I mean, at least a red flag that maybe, you know, you should be careful, cautious. Or, you know, adverse media. Adverse media means you see in the newspaper that one of your client has been arrested for drug trafficking. What should you do? You should immediately keep a closer watch on the account. And in, in Bangladesh, we are required to file a SAR. So this is also a cultural matter. Because, see, when you say, when you risk assess your client high, low, medium, that is for you. You don't tell your customer, sir, you are high risk, therefore you need this. He should not know what, how you assess him. Okay, so this is internal. You should not disclose. Similarly, it's illegal. In fact, it's a punishable offense to disclose that you have filed a SAR against somebody to anybody, not only the client. It's on a need to know basis. There should be confidentiality so that nobody knows other than you know, the relevant authorized persons in the bank and the FIU or whoever you file your STR with. So suspicious activity transition not properly defined or communicated and your foreign correspondents, apart from this questionnaire that you need to fill in, they will want to interview you. Earlier, you know, whatever you wrote, you gave a certification, accepted. Today, they're saying, okay, you mentioned this. You mentioned you have a, you know, screening process. So, okay, you have, so how do you do it? So you say, okay, when we onboard a client, we, we search this name in the OFAC database, or maybe you use Acuity, or, or maybe some other system. But most banks are not using systems yet. They think they can do it manually. This is really not possible. Transaction monitoring and sanction screening, you will not be able to do manually. This, is, I mean, if anybody says they do it, I don't believe it. Okay, so you need proper systems also for that. Anyway, so they will ask you, okay, we have got this local system somebody is giving you. So how do, which list you actually screen against? Then you say, ah, okay, oh, fact, you say. But that's not the only list. Okay, what about PEP list? I think rightly someone mentioned today that it's a challenge. 
to build a pep list, local pep list, or domestic peps list. But you have to do it for yourself because peps are automatically high risk. And especially, bribery and corruption is, be is being focused on more and more, which I'll come to later. And usually, it's the AML or the compliance department. They have to look after, they call it ABC compliance. ABC means anti-money laundering, bribery, and corruption. Wolfsburg Group Correspondent Banking Due Diligence Questionnaire. OK. Anybody heard of this? From where? How did you come to know about this, sir? How do you know about this? Exactly. What about other? No you don't have correspondent. Who, I mean, I understand the entire banking committee is almost here. So you, here, there's a representative of the Nepali banks. Some are cream de la cream. Okay. Now, do, haven't you heard of this? How did you hear of this? Probably. This was sent by one of your correspondent bank asking you to complete it. Right? It, it, it would be great if you could have a microphone. Please speak frankly, because I'll tell you why I raised this. This correspond, Wolfsburg Group Correspondent Banking Due Diligence Questionnaire is posing huge challenges in my country because this is the standard against which they are measuring us. And you will struggle giving, and if you give a wrong answer, then it, it makes a very bad impression about your bank. But it will be extremely difficult to say yes to all the answers if you don't have those programs or policies or processes in place. And they are giving you a time, you see, they, that now initially it was one year, maybe they will extend, because they are to understand that this, I, they should understand that this is posing a serious challenge. So here in Nepal, you don't face any problem with this. This is going to become your most important, serious, whatever you call it. Even it is a risk. Because you need to upgrade yourself, your program systems of compliance, to be able to affirmatively answer the questionnaire. But now the challenges we are facing in our country, I'm trying to highlight those. Now they talk about approved policies and procedures. These are, maybe your challenge could be more or less, I don't know. This is what we did a gap analysis ourselves. And we found that, like, we don't have an anti-bribery and anti-corruption policy per se. We have it in our code of conduct. Our employees are, so that is, but there are no processes in place, like AML, you know, to test, or there is no training on this given, which, like AML, you have to give awareness training. And then there are other measures you need to take. Like, you need to, uh, in your contracts with your vendors and other service providers, you need to put in place a clause saying that you don't, they cannot engage in any bribery in respect of any dealings with you. So that's a huge challenge we are facing in Bangladesh. First of all, putting in place the entire program for a proper bribery and anti-corruption policy. The one reason is, of course, like Nepal, we are also among the top anti-corrupt uh, corrupt countries in the world. That may be so, 
but that will not step stop them from asking you to comply so just like aml happened aml was not there in nepal 20 years ago but today see if so much focus is getting because globally we will become paraya and therefore th this is important proper due edd for particular high risk clients embassies nbfis cash intensive business non resident and foreign individuals quality assurance and compliance testing of the policy the your bribery and anti corruption policy yearly reviews of your aml safety policy so our like even aml safety policy was being reviewed on a two yearly basis not every year but if you have to answer affirmatively you need to have this then it requires to have automated systems for sanction screening for transaction monitoring for risk grading like you are manually putting in the risk high risk low no the system will give a risk grading based on inputs that you give about your customer then then automated kyc or ekyc and transaction profile reviews self assessments and independent testing screening against peeps and adverse media so this is also a challenge for us then risk assessment maybe for client onboarding we are doing some risk and in fact in, in bangladesh uh, there is now a standard account opening form this standard account opening form is mandated by the regulator in that form itself there is a kyc assessment sheet and therefore manually you can score a client high risk low and then depending on the when you fill up that you add up the scores you get a number and if it's more than 14 then it's a high risk but they are saying it should be automated risk assessment for bribery and corruption this has not yet started maybe is one or two foreign banks have it inherent risk control effectiveness of say bribery and anti corruption risk residual risk assessment and monitoring this applies both to aml and bribery and corruption then there is this they will ask you in that questionnaire about whether you have a designated money laundering compliance officer which you have but they will also ask you whether you have a designated bribery anti bribery officer which we don't have then about training and development what are you doing for training not only on the ml side but on the bribery and corruption side e learning what do you have and whether you retain records if you do for which uh, i mean length of time whether you have a master database for aml cft how quality assurance is done on your customer due diligence and who does compliance testing at what frequency these we have faced in that uh, question are these are posing challenges for us maybe for you there could be other or maybe less i don't know depending but this is one thing that this year in 2019 this will be intensified and what happens is just like you use your kyc form while onboarding your customer in the bank individuals or company accounts based on that you know th that so they are actually using this now this is a standard form just like the uniform account opening form in bangladesh this is a uniform account opening form for correspondent banks for onboarding foreign financial institutions as customers or delisting them you have heard the word de risking de risking means these global banks have severed relationships with local banks in many countries the worst affected is the caribbean in the caribbean two central banks have been delisted in bangladesh also about more than 50% of banks have been delisted for not meeting it's not very far when it will come here in nepal so you get ready 
I think this will be the most serious challenge for you this year. Maybe they will watch you over this year. And they, it's not enough that you fill in this questionnaire and send it. They will call and ask you specific probing questions, which you have affirmatively answered. And then they will want to come and see the, those global banks, will come and watch and see for themselves. So that's kind of verification. That is a requirement for, of their regulators. So then there are other risks, transaction reporting, information sharing, purchasing, purchase and sale of monetary instruments, fund transfers, foreign currency, account record keeping, blah, blah. If in any one of these, you want me to, I mean, if you have a question, then I, I'll take it. Third party payment processors, broker deposits, referral agents, privately owned automated teller machine. These are all considered high risk trade finance lending activities, <coughs> trust and asset management, non-resident aliens and foreign individuals, politically exposed persons, embassy and foreign consulate accounts. You heard about Riggs Bank in the US? <coughs> there was this bank called Riggs Bank. Their major customers were embassies in Washington, DC. So every country has an embassy in Washington, D.C. And they were, and of course, they handled high, high net worth clients, and their high net worth clients were like Sani Abacha or other dictators. And they used to, you know, they have this private jets, company owned, and they fly to Africa in some country to collect cash. They bring in, say, to, or three billion or seven billion dollars cash and they deposit in, in New York or in, in Washington, I don't know. This has happened and th they were warned and this bank has been closed. And after that, the foreign embassy accounts have become high risk. So root causes of compliance weaknesses the strength of an institution's compliance culture. And culture is a trickle down from the top, as I said, from the behavior, from, from his body language, not only from what he says. Because he says one thing, he means something else. And you know what he means. It, it's not only top meaning at the head of his level, it can be at the branch level. Even the branch manager, he, yeah, he, he thinks he's the CEO of the branch. So he will tell you, forget that, now do this first. W what about your, have you met your target? Then you get scared, don't ask him anything. The institution's willingness to commit sufficient resources. See, previously, as rightly mentioned, in audit or in, in compliance functions or in control functions, the most mit misfit guy in the bank was put there. You know, if he was not fit for any other job, you put him there. That will not do. That culture has to change. And you have to give this. In fact, this was not earlier considered a core banking function even. The guys in compliance or in, in transaction monitoring, they are not considered as involved in core banking. Oh, they are doing something extra. No, this is core banking. You can go to jail, personally also. Your bank can be fined. So in whatever you call core banking, nobody goes to jail for that. The strength of an institution's IT and monitoring process, very important. Increasingly, IT, automated, automation, I mean, you cannot, if you, are, if you don't do it, then you, you're going to be history soon because you cannot cope. The institution's risk management systems. I think I've come to the end. So I can take some questions.
Uh, okay, the first one is how banks in Bangladesh make business. You know, this is a very good question. I think I touched upon it when I mentioned about Triple C. This is the Central Compliance Committee. This is the policy making committee. And this committee is entrusted with implementing the policy also and regulations relating to animal safety. And it has to be comprised of the heads of corporate banking, the head of retail banking, the head of operations, the head of uh, technology, minimum. Okay, then you can include the head of finance and others. Oh, also the head of HR. Because HR needs to have policies in place also. Because resourcing is so important, human resource. You know, you need proper human resources, not, not only the skill sets, but also the adequacy, number of them. So legal mechanism for controlling shell companies in your country. Okay, frankly speaking, we, we, there are no shell countries in the company because in Bangladesh, if you have to register, if you incorporate a limited liability company, then you are required to provide your national ID and your TIN certificate. So these are mandatory. So in that sense, there are no shell companies. Of course, we have subsidiaries. Uh, for instance, Eastern Bank has four subsidiaries, one in Hong Kong. But that's wholly owned subsidiary. So you know who is the beneficial owner. So this is not a challenge. Shell companies in Bangladesh is not posing some challenge in, in that sense, the way it is meant globally. But locally, as I said, there, that there are proprietorships uh, which are, somebody is shown as a proprietor, maybe a wife is shown as a proprietor. But it, because he's a government servant, and, and it's, not it's not allowed, and therefore he uses his wife's name. So, so those kind of things can happen, but then you, you need to dig down and, and, and know the real owner that, has been, that is doing a beneficial ownership. Where DD of a foreign company leads us to UBO being listed com company, is it still mandatory for us to identify the individual UBO? Your opinion, please. Acha, what is DD? Oh. Okay, DD is due diligence. So ultimate benefit of being a listed company. See, as I mentioned, if the FATF standard is about finding the beneficial owner of entities and other arrangements like trusts. So, of course, it is required. If it's a limited liability company, then you need to know who, who are the beneficial owners. If it is, again, owned by another listed company, then you have to actually unwrap. Unwrap and find out the individual Individuals who own 20, more than 20% stake in, in, in that company. So there is this unwrapping process that needs to be done. Of course, the risk assessment involves probably impact. Of course, impact. It's not only probability. It's, it's also what impact it will have on your business. So, so probability into impact is your risk score. Can, uh, can Roman? Of course. See, whistleblowing policy again started in the US and most companies, they are all required to have it. And after the Enron fiasco and all that, and Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, this has become mandatory for even non-financial companies. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, all foreign banks have it. Maybe they call it differently. Like in Standard Chartered, it's called speak up policy. In American Express, it used to be there. It used to be called RSA. And uh, this is like reporting any wrongdoing. Not particularly, whistleblowing is not 
actually confined to AML. Rather, it's not really about AML. AML, you have a similar whistle blowing, but that whistle blow, you blow to the regulators through a suspicious activity reporting. But of course, in AML also, because the whistleblower policy means if you, if an employee, any employee, discovers or feels that some wrongdoing has happened, he is supposed to report this. And this is confidentially done. So who do you report to? Normally, you report to your supervisor. I said normally. Because if it is about the, if your supervisor is doing some wrongdoing, then you don't report to him. <laughs> then you report to his supervisor. Now, if you think that his supervisor he thinks that your supervisor is a star performer and he's, he's you know, blue-eyed boy, then you don't report to his supervisor. Then you report to the CEO or you report to a compliance function. So usually the compliance function is also the receive and they, even if you don't report directly to the compliance function, see other banks, they have hotlines. They, on telephone, you can do it. Okay. And on email, you can do it. But it all comes to the compliance department. There is a guy in that department who handles this. He's going to investigate confidentially. Because what you report, it may be your perception. For instance, I got a report. I got a report that one guy, he had taken some company say, device home. Somebody saw him put it in his bag and take in it, so he filed this report. But when I dig down, it happened that they had, a, they had to give a presentation, they were going abroad, they took approvals uh, to take that out. So that's fine. So nothing is done about that. And you cannot retaliate against, but the person reporting was right, that was what she, she or he thought. Something wrong was happening. So whistleblower, not only AML, but they can uh, sir uh, could i add something to this please uh, as you know like you know currently the regional banking i think i think the global global banking i would call it uh, chanda kocha of icc bank the blue eyed girl or lady you know the diva of banking globally i know chanda jasto jaine a lady banker the most uh, respected and the the height she is created actually she got the victim of herself, you know, a kind of, she established the whistleblowing process in that bank. I mean, she was the part of the leadership team who really actually established the whistleblowing team, uh, like culture at the bank. And that whistleblowing culture, which she had been instrumental in establishing in the bank, actually now costed her the job. And how it happened? I mean, the whistleblower started with the, you know, like, a, uh, it started with the, perhaps with the regulator, with the ministry. I think they pulled in, uh, PM's office because nobody was listening, but ultimately that went up bizarre only when the media reported. If you like study that case, very classical case, and I would encourage you to blow your whistle against anyone that you feel in your bank organization are doing wrong. Because bank ko ko hoina, ko hoina, bank zanta ko, and hami ruk custodian ho. Kindly be mindful, and you might go to jail. Our DI sabaun unsa aza bilka. I mean, CIB ko, we have a case. You know, I had gone to CIB custody, I would uh, talk to him uh, later. Several times, we banking industry. So, you can do it further. Kindly, I'd like to take those two questions. The Pramod Burji, he asked how to ex access ML risk for payable through accounts. I did not understand the question, but ex payable through accounts, your correspondent bank has to agree that you know, you, no, your, you know. My concern was that, so these are accounts Example, risky for the angle of money laundering. So how as a banker or as a compliance officer one needs to assess the risk? Okay, assess the risk. Assess. 
Okay, SS. So, SS risk means before, okay, it's like credit risk, right? You do your AML, you do your customer due diligence, you onboard the client, and then if he wants a loan, you do a, another risk assessment. His credit worthiness to give a loan, right? Similarly, you are allowing one of your customers to actually write a check on your bank's account in New York. Who, do, who would you allow that to? Must be your most valuable clients and must be having sound, very, very sound reasons. Otherwise, they could write any check and this amount will be gone. So your assessment, first of all, you will only allow your most, nowadays I don't think your foreign correspondent bank will allow that. So <laughs> gradually this is being actually not being used so much, at least not for third world banks like us. But still, if you have to allow, then you have to make sure of that your, that customer is like, if not Pope, but at least uh, you're very, very comfortable with that customer to allow him to write a check on the bank's account in New York or London or whatever. Now, what is the current position problem of Bangladesh banks in terms of AML safety, considering Bangladesh also a member? Okay. So first of all, Bangladesh is not also a member. Bangladesh is a founding member, one of the founding members of APG. That's one. Okay, and then this year Bangladesh is co-chairman of APG. That is why, I don't know, I'm not trying to, because I, I, have, I have not assessed the entire South Asia, but because I used to work for Standard Chartered and we used to have this conference. In fact, in Nepal we were supposed to have the day after the earthquake, the con conference was scheduled. I had bought tickets and everything, but then this earthquake happened, we didn't fly. Okay, so among the South Asian countries, Bangladesh is ahead in terms of AML safety, at least on training. The amount of training that has happened in Bangladesh has happened nowhere else. And this is because in our law, the onus for organizing this training was placed on the regulator, meaning the central bank at that time. BFI was created much later. And at that time, even BF, I mean, AML Department of Bangladesh Bank was, I mean, they were just being formed and the right skill sets were not available. So they approached foreign banks. And I happened to be one of those guys who had to go all over, I had never traveled in Bangladesh before so much as, as uh, Central Bank took me to many places I have not gone to before. Every district, in every district, training happened, classroom training like this. And there were challenges. There were some districts which were so remote that power failure was, I mean, like it will go out for more than an hour. So, and then you have, to, you know, speak there and still get them engaged, sweating it out. So even today, the number, I mean, in December, I myself conducted at least 15 trainings, sessions. So in terms of training, we are far ahead. In terms of regulation or policy, we are no less than India. In terms, but in implementation, I don't know about India, but in Bangladesh, I think in implementation, uh, there is a lot of room for improvement. I must say that. And, and we are working towards that. And the regulator is gradually, you know, putting on the screws, fining you, giving you warning and all that. So I think in South Asia, uh, we are, I mean, not up to global standard, but in South Asia, we are quite ahead. This much I can tell you. You, okay. Okay, some impacts, definitely. See, when de-risking happens, 
first of all, even in global context, what the global bank is doing, they are thinking that your AML standards are not up to mark. So you pose uh, additional risk, and the amount of money they make from this relationship with you is not worth it, because they have to pay hefty fines. BNP Paribas paid in 2015 8.9 billion dollars. I don't think the combined asset of all the banks in Nepal is 9 billion dollars. Okay, so that's the amount of fine one bank paid. So therefore they are worried and they feel that is what they are de-risking. Otherwise, you know, this is not some, you know, making a, it's not a marriage, you know. It's more than that. So even marriages get divorced. So what happens is, if you, if you feel that, sometimes not for AML reason, but you are not giving them as much business. So they don't want to deploy resources for you. They will do it for where they get more money. That could be a reason for de-risking. And for AML, of course. And for AML, even if that happens, that what they are doing, they are actually putting greater risk on the global, if you, in the global context. Why? Because if they de-risk you, you don't stop doing business. So you try to find alternative. So you go to these alternative banks whose standards are lower, and therefore, the, actually, the risk globally is increasing. So that is why even FATF was concerned, there's a paper, you should, oh, let me tell you. As I, I was very happy to see that um, Sanjeev sir and his NBI is so tech savvy. So everybody has a smartphone or whatever device. In any training, nobody can give you, I mean, make you a master. You have to, whatever new concepts or not, whatever new terms you find, you should do a Google search at your free time. For instance, you should visit the, globe, the corresponding uh, Wolfsburg group site. And they have, they are not fools, you know. They will not give you a questionnaire which is difficult to fill without giving some guidance. So there are some good guidance there. And there are good guidance on risk assessment on, on various aspects, you know, of filling up that form. I think you should study that. Download it, it's free. Okay, similarly, I think all of us working in the compliance function, because increasingly, we are more impacted by global regulations, right? And therefore, we should be updated ourselves. So that's a good way to do it. Uh, and for de-risking, the economic impact is that, the bank that is de-risked or the client that you de-risk has to find an alternative method. And if he goes to an alternative guy, their standards of risk management or is not same. It is bound to be lower. And therefore, that poses a risk for the economy, for the global economy itself. And for a country like, uh, say, Bangladesh, So when they de-risk about more than 50% banks, then we are into trade finance. As, as Sir rightly mentioned, Bangladesh is the second highest in the world in ready-made garment exports. Okay, now that gets impacted because those banks cannot tra transact with global banks. So th that's the economic impact. So you, they have to go to these are concentrated into a few banks, which is itself a concentration risk. That's it. 